Hello, everyone, and welcome to the NERLA, Northeast Regional Learning Analytics and NMC Learning Analytics Workshop and Webinar. Um, hopefully, um, you can, everyone can hear me okay. We have a, a full uh, session scheduled today, um, and uh, I'm really happy to see so many were able to join us uh, at the end of the academic year. I know that uh, a lot of people are already done, and those of you that are still on campus are working very hard this week. So. Um, welcome. Uh, I want to get right into it. Uh, we've got uh, four speakers today uh, after myself. Um, I'll just start my webcam so I can say hi to everyone. Um, uh, welcome. Uh, this is something that uh, we're really excited about here at the NMC. Um, this webinar is the conclusion and almost the icing on the cake for a week-long learning analytics workshop that started uh, I think the last week of October and the first week of November. Uh, we had several teams from actually across the, uh, the country and, and from uh, I think Argentina um, uh, participate and really get some hands-on help uh, from learning analytics. Um, and uh, uh, David, our second presenter, will, will give us a kind of a top line of what that was and, and how to participate in things like that in the future. Um, the exciting news I really wanted to share with the NMC community is the fact that this type of webinar um, we have done um, NMC Connect webinars and uh, the Live with Linda series and things like that. And um, the community's kind of asked us, you know, what what can we expect? And um, if you notice down here, um, we've got a, a, a new uh, a new logo, which is something I love. But also the idea that um, the NMC Horizon Connect series of webinars is going to start off with today's webinar. Uh, we are going to. Uh, organize the 2012 season of Horizon Connect webinars around the topics and innovations and technologies that we will be uh, reading about in our Horizon reports. Um, for, two, for 2012, obviously, we have the Horizon Report 2012 Higher Ed Edition coming out in February. Uh, we will have a K-12 through edition uh, coming out later in the year. And at the end of the year, we have the Museum Edition. And um, the technologies and innovations that make uh, that make their way into the Horizon reports will be kind of the organizing principle around these types of uh, webinars moving forward. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is uh, iTunes U. We have a uh, we have a new account with iTunes U. It's about two months old, and we're getting about uh, 10,000 people a month there. Um, it's really an amazing um, archive of 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 not only podcasts like these, but also publications and. Uh, keynotes from conferences, uh, a lot of our Second Life symposia can be found there. Um, so if you haven't visited uh, iTunes U, the NMC account on iTunes U, please do. It's an amazing resource. Um, uh, maybe suggest uh, some good reading over the holidays for those of you with free time. Um, but specific to today's, um, we have um, put a collection called the NMC Horizon Connect Learning Analytics Collection. And this is live right now, and it's... Uh, um, uh, sound getting an echo that hasn't resolved. Um, it may be me. Is anyone else getting an echo? No. Okay. Sorry, North Dakota. It seems like a personal problem, so we'll continue. Um, but this link here uh, at the top of the um, of the chat, the iTunes U Apple uh, Web Objects links, takes you to the collection, the NMC Horizon Connect collection. Uh, what is in there already are three podcasts. From the uh, from the workshop that we had in October, and November, we've got uh, um, uh, Johan Larusen's um, introduction to learning analytics. We have Zach Stein's um, assessment in learning analytics, and Ruben Puentedora, who's also uh, here today in the chat. Hello, Ruben. Um, social network analysis, a great uh, a great uh, set of three podcasts that were uh, pulled from the uh, the workshop um, that we had last month. So. Um, there are already about uh, I don't know, an hour and a half of learning analytics podcasts in there. And then today's session, um, if, you, if you go to iTunes U and you subscribe to this uh, podcast, when we have today's archive podcast available, it will automatically update you and download to your iTunes account uh, when this podcast is available. So um, just want to let you know that uh, there's a lot of exciting things around the Horizon Project, of which learning analytics has been a huge part. Uh, Samantha Adams uh, with the NMC will... We'll end today's session kind of taking you through a sneak peek at the 2012 uh, higher ed report specifically around learning analytics. Um, but I want to get going. Um, if we can go ahead and make David a, a, a presenter and get his can going, 
I'd like to turn it over to him and uh, he can give us a recap. Um, I want to introduce uh, David Wedeman, um, the man responsible for making the, uh, the NERLA NMC uh, uh, relationship work. Um, David is a PhD, has a PhD in comparative literature and is the director of research and instruction at Brandeis University. Um, his job is to understand teaching and learning and develop related strategic initiatives, much like uh, the one we're here today to talk about. Um, he serves on the board of NERCOMP, uh, Eli, Niddle, and NERLA, the Northeast Regional Learning Analytics, who are co-sponsoring today's event. Um, he's a co-founder of the Learning Organization Academy uh, and the lead research in the A15 Research Group. Uh, he is interested in all things learning, and um, and I see that his, uh, his, he's now a presenter, so hopefully he's going to join me here. And I would like to turn this over to David. Uh, I do want to let... Um, uh, I want to let everyone know that Q&A is best handled in the chat. Uh, we'll also be sharing some links uh, in the chat window as well, so uh, join us there, and, um, and I hope you enjoy the next hour as much as, uh, as I will. So David, uh, is your, I, can, I think I can hear you now. Hi, Paul. Can you hear me, everybody? Yes, we can. So well, I'm going to stop my webcam and and turn it over it's to you. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a little stressful turning those things, all the machines on at the last second. Um, hi, everybody. <laughs> this, uh, I'm David Wiedemann. I'm from Brandeis. Thank you for the introduction, Paul. Um, and uh, Paul asked me to talk a little bit about our, our workshop that we did in October and November, and I'm happy to because it was a blast and, and also good, I think. Um, am I sharing my video? Now I am. There I am. Can you see me? I could use a haircut. Um, here we go. So um, first, let me talk a little bit about NERLA. So NERLA is a um, just an informal association of people who care about learning analytics. It's in the Northeast region. But as I tell, we're not exclusive. As I tell people, everywhere is Northeast of somewhere else. So <laughs> that means anyone can join. Um, Johan Larusen is our, Larusen is our chair. Uh, he's, he couldn't join us today. He's uh, on the plane to Iceland this morning. But uh, basically what we do is think and talk about learning analytics. We do events like uh, this, like our workshop um, in October. We consult on learning analytics projects. We uh, try to entice partners to collaboratively develop projects. Um, and we have this little secret project we're working on. It's not that secret. is um, a learning analytics center, which I'll talk about in a minute. The main thing, though, that we're thinking about at the moment is our symposium, which happens in January in Southbridge, Massachusetts, um, just half an hour to an hour or so, depending on how fast you drive, outside of the Boston area megaplex. Um, we would love to have you there. I can talk a little bit more about that later. Have another slide. Um, the Learning Analytics Center, our recent project is just basically, I thought you might be interested. It's the idea that Maybe a lot of schools are interested in learning analytics, but they might not have the resources to, you know, devote a full-time staff member or some researchers to create a program in-house. Is this something that we could do in a kind of a syndicated way? Several schools combine, each buy-in, and, and create a, a sort of a little research group, um, share data, help decide collaboratively what the research areas are, and then all the, all the schools apply whatever the developed projects are that come out of the research group. If this sounds interesting to you, um, let me know. My contact information will be at the end. Um, but we, ah, here we go. Let me actually talk about what Paul asked me to talk about, our learning analytics workshop. Um, this was in the last week of October. Um, the comment, it was a collaboration, as Paul said, of, of NMC and NERLA. Paul and Samantha were um, the NMC people, and Johan and I represented NERLA. Um, the genesis of the program is a little bit unusual a design, I guess you'd say. We thought about having your standard webinar where we just give a, I guess, a pre, you know, sort of a sequential presentations on established learning analytics projects. But we thought, A, that's been done. Uh, B, there's a lot of information out there if you want to read about what the successful projects are at the moment. Like Malcolm Brown's ELI paper is really good. We thought maybe what we could provide is a space where people who were starting to think about learning analytics projects could just work together to develop their ideas. 
And we wondered if that would work, if it would be valuable, and if it would also kind of, um, I guess, lay the foundation of a community of people or contribute to the community of learning analytics folks. So that's the way we approach this. Um, oh, put this slide in. <laughs> Just on whimsy, I threw this slide in. Um, this is something that a uh, partner and I developed, uh, Sarah Valkoviak, a friend and I developed years ago when we were trying to uh, emphasis, show, draw people's attention to the, uh, to the beginning of ideas and how important it is to invest in the moment between when you have an idea and you have a product. And I threw this in there because I think our, our, our workshop focused on what we have labeled there as the strategic idea action gap. People that had an inclination or an idea, but not yet a product. Um, anyway, the program is really simple. Basically, we asked the participants to give us, to, to, to sit in on three one and a half hour um, sessions in Adobe Connect, just like we're doing right now. Each session had a keynote speaker who was provocative, intellectual, and fun, and also had a section where the, the, the people participating could talk to each other. Um, and that format actually worked out really well. In between, we assigned homework. So for the first day, you had to read some background learning analytics things. In between day one and day three, you had to take your project and develop it on our template. Day three, we had feedback on your project from other team members. Friday, we had some generative questions. How did the program go? What are your plans now? How can we build a community, et cetera? Um, he's, you probably can't read this very small writing, but these are the teams. We had a team from Houston Community College, uh, Bridgeport Education, otherwise known as Ashford, Ashford University, Wellesley College, Brandeis University, and a team from the sovereign nation of Argentina, which <laughs> needs no more further specification than just the country name. Um, the uh, the details that pop out of me is the lessons learned or the key pieces of, of our of our of our workshop were that this model was unusual in that it was free, it was opt-in, it was in work. That is, you didn't have to actually have to really leave or disrupt your workday that much to go. You just had to find time to go to these three meetings. Um, and it was collaborative professional development. So there wasn't really an expert telling you the truth or teaching you what to do you and your peers were developing that together. Um, and these are peers that until you came to the workshop, you didn't even know. So it was sort of a built on faith kind of thing. Um, in a sense, it was, it, was a, it was almost a classic learning community model if you followed the learning community literature and pedagogy and, and teaching and learning literature. Um, but except that the community didn't pick its own research topic. I mean, we assigned learning analytics. If we hadn't done that, it would have been a pure learning community. Um, the results were great. The feedback was good. People really enjoyed the model. They, I think they appreciated the ability to have these kinds of conversations and work without having to leave work, go somewhere else, uh, and not having to pay money. Um, the uh, people valued the feedback they got on their projects and were glad to have the opportunity to develop projects. Um, without this kind of thing, I think a lot of the projects that were articulated through this program would probably remain today unarticulated. Um, a couple of the, the feedback notes that I that were strongest was uh, there was quite a bit of um, appreciation for the structure that combined abstract intellectual keynotes, if you will, with uh, concrete. Um, details of people's real work conditions and lives that that seemed to be a really um, it's just a really sort of powerful combination um, and everybody spontaneously asked they, there was a feeling that we had developed a kind of a community that was special and there was a desire to continue that so today's event is actually in part a way to try to continue that um, I guess the, the biggest message for me from the thing or the learning that I wanted to relate is that this event did not have a lot of overhead. Um, to get people together in the Adobe Connect session and to do some lightweight feedback and project development, which is meaningful and valuable, doesn't take a lot of overhead. And uh, we could conceivably do these things regularly. And I think that the five teams that participated probably doesn't tap the whole world of possible uh, schools that are interested in learning analytics. So if there's interest in more events like this, I think we could conceivably run two, three, four more cohorts over a semester if we wanted to, and that it would be valuable and worth uh, worth doing. 
Anyway, so that's the end of my talk about our event. I leave you with two learning analytics events that I know of. The symposium I already mentioned. Our keynote is Malcolm Brown, the director of ELI, Hitchcock's Learning Initiative. Um, we'll be giving recent papers on learning analytics. Southbridge, you could conceivably, if you're not in New England, if you're in New England, you can get there. If you're not in New England, you could actually fly in, fly out the day before the day of um, kind of thing and not and sort of make it uh, into a, a fun little trip. If you're interested and want to know more details, feel free to contact me. And, and finally, Educause Learning Initiative has really made learning analytics one of their big, um, I guess, strategic directions. And a lot of their programming is around this. And they have a, in particular, they have a leadership roundtable happening at their annual meeting in February, specifically on learning analytics. I think this, it's actually filled, the registration's filled, but there's a wait list. And if you're interested, I think it's worth getting on the wait list. Um, with no further ado, this is me. Um, you can email me, call me, send me a tweet. I'm on my blog. Well, David, thank you very much. And I, and I just also want to just um, um, express uh, how much we enjoyed working with, the, with NERLA on this and how easy it came together. <coughs> I mean, we, had, we had several conversations about it, but once we kind of figured out what we wanted to do, it came together really well. And like you said, it, it wasn't a lot of uh, wasn't a lot of money. It wasn't a lot of investment, but it was a, it was people that just wanted to make it happen. And I think that with a community like the NMC and NERLA, when we get together, we don't need a thousand people for this to be a success. You know, twenty, thirty people at a time can make a lot of difference. So, again, um, thank you very much. Um, and now I'd like to introduce uh, one of the participants in the workshop. Um, and that's Tom Hames. He's with Houston Community College. He's the director of technology at HCC's Northwest Campus. Um, HCC has over 22,000 students spread over four campuses, so that's no small, no small job for Tom. Um, uh, before he was at HCC, uh, he's been the director and instructional design coordinator there since 2006. But before that, he was a faculty in government, has worked with Apple and Motorola and several other dot coms. Um, he's the author of the three E's strategy for overcoming resistance to technology adoption, and he also has a blog. And I'll put those two uh, I'll put those two sources into the chat room. Uh, Tom, uh, I can't hear you yet. Let's get your audio going first. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Tom, how does that? I did that perfectly. I've had the mute turned on in my microphone. I had everything turned on. So <laughs> excellent. So. Um, Again, Tom, I'll turn it over to you. If there's any questions for David, I think he's going to stick around in the chat. So please ask those as well as questions for Tom as we move forward. Um, but take it away. Tom, are you going to use your webcam or not? Yeah, I just turned it on. Oh, it says start sharing. There we yeah. go. There you go. There's, there's always one more button. <laughs> there we go. Can everybody see me now? All right. Uh, first of all, apologies. I am sucking on a cough drop to keep my voice going. So. Um, and uh, actually, first of that, uh, thank you, David, and uh, all the people at the NMC who made this possible. Uh, this is a really good idea, and I'm excited about uh, the future of what we can uh, uh, do with this kind of format. Um, it's, it's always good to get outside perspectives on things, um, and we often find ourselves in environments at the colleges where we're talking to people who aren't really thinking about some of these uh, leading edge things like uh, learning analytics in, in, in quite the creative way that I know the NMC crowd does. So um, it's always it's always good to be among friends. Okay, let me talk a little bit about um, what we're where we're sort of heading on this at uh, at HCC. Um, I actually came into the um, the project uh, or the workshop with a project already in hand that we attempted to get funding on uh, last spring and uh, were unsuccessful on that. Uh, that was a, a local uh, grant uh, from the college itself. Um, but we've now, uh, we're now working on a much bigger grant proposal, uh, which is around the Gates grant, actually, um, to uh, do an expanded version of the ideas that we're sort of playing with there. The sort of the idea that we initially came up with and, and gamed out was to come up with a very easy way for faculty, both in an in-class um, 
uh, as well as an online scenario to input data into a database uh, around a fairly small set of variables. Um, the idea being that uh, faculty should be able to put uh, very, uh, to be able to input all the variables for, uh, say, a 30-person class in less than five minutes per class session. Some of it would be done while the class is ongoing. Some of it would be done uh, a little bit um, uh, or after the fact. Um, and then just sort of compile all this data into a database uh, and use that to extract um, interesting information, we hope, about the learning process. Um, that was the basic project idea that we came up with in the spring. Now, going on to the uh, into the into the uh, uh, workshop, um, we well uh, we discovered fairly quickly, or I discovered fairly quickly, as I was uh, dealing with some of the issues that the workshop raised, particularly the issues that came up on uh, Wednesday in our discussion with Zach Stein. Um, is that one of the key things we have to think about when we're dealing with learning analytics is the old garbage in, garbage out problem. The hardest thing that I think uh, uh, comes up when we're trying to deal with these questions is what exactly is learning? Um, what exactly is education? How do you measure success in that? How do you deal with the, uh, how do you get granular enough to provide something that's actually useful? Now, we'd come up with a set of variables in the initial project. Now, I never intended those variables to be the final variables. Um, but the initial project was designed to uh, take place over the course of uh, an academic year uh, with uh, fall semester, spring semester, summer semester. In the fall semester, the idea was to put together all of the faculty that were going to be in the pilot. And we were focusing on uh, developmental English. Um, and actually bring in somebody like Ruben uh, or uh, maybe George Siemens to workshop out ideas around uh, what those variables should look like. However, we felt the need to put in some variables just so that we could give the grant the grantors some sort of idea um, as to what exactly we were after. But um, when we put those variables before the group, the question very quickly came up. Um, what exactly are you measuring? Now, the five variables that we had originally come up with was, did the student show up for class? Did the student, um, that's a yes or no. Uh, did, the, did the student do the assignment, the homework assignment, yes or no? Rate the level of participation of the student in the class on a sliding scale, one to five, something like that. Did the student access um, outside uh, resources in the learning process, library, tutoring, that sort of stuff. And then finally, did the student interact with other students from within the class outside of class uh, with relationship to, to the assignments? Um, and Zach is, in particular, looked at that and said exa that exact question, what exactly are you measuring here? Um, and um, uh, it was actually in some ways a very dispiriting exercise because I saw how right he was and I also saw exactly how hard this is going to be to do right. And uh, I'm a big fan of doing things right and on this, again, you've got to start right in order to get something useful out of the end of it. Um, so since then, I, uh, since I've, it's led me into a very deep examination around what exactly we could theoretically measure that uh, would, A, be reasonably easy for a faculty member to input the information into uh, the database, whatever that might be, and then, B, uh, would generate useful information that would really tell us something about the learning process, and not just from the perspective of an administrator, I mean from the perspective of a faculty, and ultimately is from the perspective of a uh, student. Um, and so, one of the things that sort of came to me actually as I was struggling with something with uh, some ideas from my own class and some stuff that came out of uh, Gardner Campbell's new media seminar, which I've been leading the local uh, version of for the last uh, three semesters, was um, the idea of um, coming up with a set of variables that are very much skills-based. So you measure skills rather than knowledge. You measure 
um, uh, and you measure skills also rather than discrete activities, which may or may not demonstrate a skill set. So I don't think you can get much more granular than that. Um, some preliminary thoughts I had around this, you know, and, and four, four variables here, you do collaboration, writing, reading, research. And I think you could actually design a system that uh, would allow the instructors to rate their own assignments in this area uh, and possibly also do it as an in-class thing um, to where they can get points for different types of, of skills. Now, again, these are preliminary thoughts, and um, those are, they're certainly subject to some serious modification. The other thing that came up uh, since the, this, the workshop is the idea of adding in um, uh, a gamification element. Um, Tom Chatfield, who uh, did a TED talk, which we use sometimes in the new, which I've used in the New Media Seminar, talks about the idea of using uh, game uh, skills or game incentives in a classroom environment or a learning environment. And one of the things he talked about was actually using progress bars and leveling up and things like that. And so I could very much see a system that would ultimately develop a student dashboard where the student could see, okay, I'm doing really good in collaboration, but I need to work on my writing or reading or something like that. And then also give them some uh, suggestions around uh, where they can get help with those particular uh, skills. So, um, so this led to the development of the plan that we're sort of working on at this point uh, for the Gates grant. So the idea is in the first semester we would still do the workshop where we would, again, bring in those faculty members that are going to be participating in the pilot, bring in some outside experts, and actually build the variables and the tool at that point. And then in the second semester, we'd pilot the tool on a limited number of students uh, from those particular faculty members. In the third semester, the, um, we'd go back and we'd look at the tool again and uh, see what worked, what didn't, what kind of data we were getting out of it, whether this was really useful, and so on and so forth. We'd refine the tool. At the same time, we would bring in people like librarians, counselors, tutors, and come up with some intervention, strat intervention strategies and some preliminary inter intervention strategies based on the data we were getting out. The fourth semester, then, we'd expand the pilot a little bit with the refined tools, and we'd test the intervention strategies to see whether or not um, they were working. And then finally, um, we would develop a, a student dashboard that would do exactly this sort of you know, immediate gratification output where, the faculty, where they're getting live data from their participation in a class uh, or in a whole series of classes in theory. Um, and uh, the cool thing about the system is if, if it works right, you could actually test out all sorts of different things. Like let's say, again, we're we're going to be focusing on developmental education uh, because it's a big deal at the community college level. Uh, we're essentially having to reteach high school here. And uh, how do you get students through that track? Because there's an incredibly high attrition rate in that track. And so that's a big focus of the grant. And um, the uh, uh, idea, once so one person suggested, well, why don't we have counselors specifically assigned to developmental ed students. Well, we could do that at one of our colleges and then just see what the bars tell us and whether or not that's making any difference. And so you could do all sorts of tests and experiments and use uh, the data analysis information, uh, the, the learning analytics information, to see whether or not it was working. And that would be uh, a really powerful tool. And when we build this and when it's done, it will be open source. That's a condition of the grant. And I'm very much a proponent of making sure, you know, that this sort of stuff gets out there. So I think my other slide. No, I think that's it. So there we go. Um, well, Tom, Tom, thank you very much. I, I, I have a question for you is um, mm -hmm. uh, your, conf your confidence around this project seems to have taken a 180 degree <laughs> shift from about six months ago. Um, are, you, uh, are you thinking that this is going to actually happen for you? Well, I mean, the funding has to be there. We have to get the grant. Um, one of the problems that I've seen in a lot of grants, now, um, the, the Gates folks seem to actually be pretty good about this, but I, could, I always have this feeling when I'm submitting for a non, you know, sort of a generalized learning grant is that 
people really don't understand what we're talking about. And so that's always a challenge. So, um, yeah, I mean, if we get the funding, we should know by next uh, summer or by, you know, May, well, actually probably even earlier than that, whether we get the funding on this and can move forward. Uh, and, uh, I mean, the technology part of this should not be super expensive uh, because we're just talking about a simple database and then building some front ends around that. And, um, you know, worst case scenario, we're talking about, you know, you know, tens of thousands of dollars, not millions, right? Um, the other parts of that, you know, getting our faculty in with mobile devices so that they can access the system on the fly, that sort of thing is, would be part of it. Those are a little bit more expensive, you know, getting all the faculty that are participating at least to iPads or something like that. Uh, that's going to cost, uh, you know, some money and so on and so forth. So, you know, yeah, I mean, I have some optimism around it. Uh, I, as I said in my slide earlier, I am the eternal optimist. I'm Mr. Stupid Idea around here. And uh, it, the trick is executing. As, as, as David said, his, what is it, the, uh, the idea execution gap that he was talking about. I love that slide, by the way. <laughs> well, it looks like uh, Chris has a, a question in the chat there. Um, are there specific variables for your uh, dev ed program that can be utilized in measuring the learning analytics tool? Um, I don't think anybody's thought about that systematically, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, the, um, our actually, one, our local, uh, the, the developmental ed chairman here at Northwest College did a thing a number of years ago. She didn't analyze variables. She basically went into the student system. Unfortunately, this was an incredibly painful process and pulled out every student to see uh, who was making it through the track and what she was essentially doing at that point was evaluating her instructors and which instructors got the students to the sequence more readily than others. And uh, the thing, of course, she discovered, well, not necessarily of course, but the thing that she discovered is the instructor who had the greatest success was the one who mothered them through it. I mean, she spent all this time outside of class helping them with stuff. So, you know, there's all these external variables that come into play and it's hard to account for all of them. I mean, we have students with some severe uh, challenges, you know, two or three kids, a single parent, uh, you know, trying to s suffer their way through college after having dropped out at 16 from high school, that sort of stuff. And there's a lot of external variables that are really hard to plot. So my idea with the variables, is, uh, as far as the learning analytics variables, is to try to get away from that as much as possible but the counselors, that's a second level problem. What I'm trying to figure out is, are they learning? What are they learning? What, you know, what can they do with that learning? And I think that if we do that, then we can watch that, that, you know, that uh, uh, game board or whatever you want to call it, go up and down with response to intervention. And maybe, you know, we can pilot an intervention, for instance, which we say, okay, well, we're going to have a daycare at this college and see if it makes any sort of difference in success rates or a daycare specifically for developmental ed students or something. You know, so you can do all sorts of tests and so. No, I don't, there are no variables. There's no, the, the, uh, 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 I, that's part of the process is figuring out what that looks like. Um, I see Laura, or I'm sorry, Lance has a uh, uh, thing there. You know, how would I define skill? Well, um, I tried. That was my first take on it. Was you know, there's certain things as as a teacher. I now teach political science at a much higher level than the developmental ed folks uh, teach. But to me, those are the kind of things in my class which I'm looking for and which when I, when I have successful classes and successful students, those are the behaviors that I see from the students. Um, the best class that I ever had, the students spontaneously formed study groups and were pulling each other along. And I mean, I've, I think I gave up 50 plus percent A's and B's in that class and that's highly unusual in my classes. Well, Tom, thank you very much. I, I have added your uh, a link to your book uh, and a link My to book. your blog. I have a book. Or the, you said the, the, I'm sorry, the article. Sorry, uh, the, the bit.ly. The book um, one day. <laughs> um, also, your, your blog is there. Um, if you, you. want to put uh, your email address in the chat for people to contact you, um, I really appreciate it, Tom. It's really nice to hear um, kind of a, a real project that's that's getting started in the NMC community here. Um, uh, it, it's amazing. and. 
um, what I'm thinking is we might put you uh, we might put you on the docket for uh, for an update on your project at the at the summer conference in Boston in uh, in June. So <laughs> could be a short now, uh, We didn't get the phone. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you. And um, if there are any more questions, please use the chat for Tom. He's going to stick around as long as he can. I know he has a meeting uh, coming up pretty quick. But uh, again, well, Tom, thank you. This room, so I'm good. I'm good until one. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Sounds good, Tom. Um, at this point, I'd like to introduce um, Am uh, our, our keynote of the day. No pressure there, Amber. Um, Amber Stubbs is a computer science PhD candidate at Brandeis University. Um, with a focus on computational linguistics and corpus an, uh, annotation. And I think that we'll, we'll find out a little bit more about exactly what that is uh, from her presentation. Um, her dissertation focuses on analyzing medical narratives through annotation and machine learning. She and her advisor, James uh, Pustyovsky? Pustyovsky. That's, oh, I got close. <laughs> are currently working on a book uh, for O'Reilly Media called Natural Language Annotation for Machine Learning. And, um, Amber, thank you so much, and thanks for everybody at Brandeis. It seems like uh, we're getting a lot of uh, a lot of Brandeisians uh, in this project, and I really appreciate it. So, um, it's all yours. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, uh, Paul pretty much covered what I was going to say about my own introduction, but uh, basically. I work with computational linguistics, and specifically, I do a lot of analyzing of large sets of text. And I understand that that's something that in learning analytics, you all are also interested in doing. Um, maybe looking at student papers, things like that. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about what we do in computational linguistics in order to analyze that kind of data to maybe give you all some ideas about what you can actually do uh, with your own data. So. Uh, briefly, I'm just going to go over what corpus linguistics is and some examples of where you actually see the results of that research in everyday uh, life. Uh, give you some examples of the kinds of things you can do with natural language data and how to create your own set so that you can actually run your own programs and things like that on whatever data you're interested in looking at. And then at the end, I have a few thoughts on applying corpus linguistics to learning analytics. So, um, my book was already introduced, but I do have to acknowledge that a lot of this talk is summarized from that. So it should come out in mid-2012 if this is useful for you. So um, what is corpus linguistics exactly? It's basically the study of language using large sets of text or speech data. So a corpus is a collection of natural language data. Uh, corpora is the plural of corpus, if you're curious. And uh, corpus, you can have unannotated or annotated. So unannotated data is just you take whatever information you're looking at, like newspaper articles or Twitter, and just use the information as is. Whereas if you annotate it, you're adding extra information. And uh, machine learning uh, tasks that use unannotated data is unsupervised, annotated data is supervised. And I'll talk more about what that actually means later. So by machine learning, I mean algorithms that can be trained to recognize patterns. I'm not going to get into the math or anything about how that works, but all these programs are actually available through toolkits like the NLTK uh, or Mallet and Weka. That's not an exhaustive list, but those are the ones that I'm familiar with. And they're all free to download. I think they're all, uh, the NLTK is definitely open source. I'm not sure about the others if you're interested in that. Um, but they're relatively easy to use considering how sophisticated they are. So um, corpus linguistics that you actually see every day, things like those of you in academia, which I think is a lot of you, uh, any time you use plagiarism detection software like turnitin.com, all of that is based on uh, corpus analysis. And so things like speech detection, like Siri and the Dragon Naturally Speaking software, anything machine translation, some recommendation systems process natural language. And then every time you type into Google and it tries to predict what you're going to type, that's all based on corpus analysis. So um, basically, I mean, those are the examples of tasks that require a lot of data, really. Um, but there are things that you can do if you have your own collection of data. So. Uh, Thanks to the internet, it's really easy to collect things. You can pretty much literally go and download Twitter if you want to. Um, but then the question is, once you've done that, what do you do with it? So there's basically two types of tasks like I outlined before. And the first one is unsupervised tasks. 
So it's, those are corpus analyses that don't require any sort of annotation, where you basically just take what you're interested, the data that you want to look at, send it to the algorithm, and kind of see what falls out. So you can review the results, but the computer doesn't have any way of knowing whether it's doing something right or wrong. Um, so an example of something like that is when you do plagiarism detection and you just compare uh, notes about uh, where, uh, sorry, you just compare the actual text in the, in the two documents. So, you know, you think the student's paper looks a little funny, you just compare it to the Wikipedia article and you see if, if the, the phrases and the sentences match up. And if they match up enough, then you end up, you know, flagging that and reviewing it to see if maybe, maybe the student's been cheating a little bit. But obviously it's not a foolproof method because if you, the student changes the words around or just uses synonyms, then uh, they've, they've defeated it. <laughs> um, so another thing you can do that's unsupervised is called document clustering. That's where you uh, have algorithms that try and find similarities between documents. So uh, commonly if you're dealing with text data, you would basically just say, you know, look at the most common words in these files and see if you can group them into some sort of you know, clusters to see what's similar and what's not. And uh, so that can also be used for plagiarism detection. And that can also be used inside of a document to see if, well, this, you know, part of the document is using one type of writing style. This one seems to be used for, you know, be using another one. Maybe these weren't written by the same person. Um, so, uh, other examples of document clustering is things like, um, I can hear someone typing. I don't know if someone else has their microphone on, but sorry. Anyway, um, so you can do things like trying to group tasks, uh, to texts into topics. So you could do things like determining if this is a um, you know, political versus sports article just based on the actual vet vocabulary in the document. And uh, so that's how a lot of spam detection works. But the problem with the system is that it, while you might be able to get a sports versus politics distinction, you're probably not going to be able to determine the difference between an editorial and a news article. So in that case, if you're not getting results that are accurate, just using the documents as they are, um, you're probably going to uh, want to start looking at supervised tasks where you start adding data to what you already have. So basically, you label or annotate your data and use that information to uh, give that to the classifier so that they can make more informed decisions based on what you've told them. And so previously with document clustering and the, the substring analysis, you just give it all your data and see what happens. In this case, because you actually have a right answer, which is the label that you're adding, you divide your data into training data, which is what you use to teach the algorithm, and then testing data so you can see how well the algorithm actually does. Um, so an example of something that you can do with supervised, a supervised task is uh, document classification, which is like document clustering, but what you actually do is you label the document. So you tell the computer, this is a political article, this is a sports article. Um, and then the algorithm can go in and try and figure out how the differently labeled articles are different from each other. So another example of that is having movie reviews labeled as positive or negative, checking the frequency of the different words that are used, and then determining how similar they are. Um, unfortunately, this technique is not entirely foolproof either. So with the Natural Language Toolkit, which I mentioned before, actually has a movie review corpus with those labels on it. And there's an example that they provide in the book where they do exactly that. They get, use the labels, feed it to a classifier, see what results they get. And they get about 80% accuracy by making correlations, which, as we all know, correlations don't necessarily equal causation. So what ends up happening is that you get uh, words like outstanding correlate to positive reviews. I'm sure that makes sense. But what also happens is that uh, Damon, as in Matt Damon, is correlated to positive reviews, and Seagal, as in Steven Seagal, gets correlated to negative reviews. <laughs> So even it's not really modeling how people are talking about the data, it's just modeling words. So if you did end up with a positive review about a Steven Seagal movie, I'll let you use your own judgment about the likelihood of that, um, it's possible that it'll still come up as negative simply because Steven Seagal is mentioned in your review. So uh, 
Um, so another example of a supervised task is part of speech tagging. Now, the document classification, you only have one label per document, so it doesn't require a whole lot of work to actually create that, those data sets. On the other side is, is part of speech tagging. We have to have one label per word in the document. Um, which Now, having that information can be really useful for a lot of different tasks. And, um, but fortunately, if, you're try if you want to actually use that, um, there are smart part of speech taggers that already exist uh, that are fairly accurate if you want to use them for whatever. And I'll talk a little bit about my next slides about why you might want to use those. So, um, uh, sorry, I'm distracted by the, dis the uh, conversation about <laughs> Steven Seagal in the chat room there. Um, so, uh, other, so what you would do with part of speech tags, uh, things like word sense disambiguation. So if you just have the word bank in a sentence, you don't, it's a lot easier to tell if they're talking about the place you put money or tilting, if you know whether it's a noun or a verb. Um, whether clean dishes is a command or a description. If your spouse leaves a note on the fridge that says clean, dis clean dishes in the sink, that's a very different use than clean dishes are in the cabinet. Um, and of course, with machine translation, uh, knowing if a word is a noun or verb can change entirely how it's translated. So uh, if you want to build your own task, fortunately, not everything is as complex as actually doing a part of speech tagging effort on your data, because that, that can take a very long time. Um, so it's possible to create an annotation task where you add your labels uh, or features to the machine learning uh, as you find that you need them. So less annotation makes it a lot, of, a lot easier to actually get results from your data. So time ML. I, I see uh, Suzanne made a comment about tagging superlatives, and that actually is a task that people do where uh, it's it's sort of sentiment analysis, I think it would be part of tagging superlatives, things like that. Uh, so you, you can look that up if that, there might be some literature relevant to that. So one example of a uh, task that is not as intense as a part of speech annotation is time ML, which is an ISO standard for temporal and event information in text. And it was developed at Brandeis. My advisor was actually the head of that project. So it's used for questioning answering systems. We have a corpus if you want to see what annotated data can look like. And what's interesting about it and what I think is relevant to the learning analytics information that you guys might want to be looking at is that it actually uses part of speech tags and sentence boundary detection tools that exist outside of the annotation. So when we actually have people going in and labeling temporal information, they're not also saying, oh, and this is where the sentence ends. We're figuring that out later and then using that information to our advantage. So you can go to timeml.org for more information on that. Um, if you do want to create your own task, we have a handy system for doing it. I, that's a little bit small, but it, we call it the matter cycle. And it basically shows, thank you, <laughs> thanks Paul. Um, it sort of shows uh, how the process of creating your own data that can be used for machine learning actually goes. So it's six steps. First, you uh, <laughs> First, you model uh, the data. So you create a representation of your task. Then you annotate. So you apply the model to your actual data. Then you teach the classifier how to recognize what you're interested in. You test it to, and then evaluate the results to see how well you actually did. And then when you find out where your algorithm is failing, you go back and fix it because you're never going to get the exact right model the first time you try this. Um, so if you actually want to use the matter cycle, I'm going to go through a more specific example using TimeML right now. Um, but do keep in mind that this can be used for lots of different tasks. So like sentiment analysis, like I mentioned before, annotating uh, space, spatial relationships, uh, the movie reviews, like I mentioned. There's lots of other things that you can apply this uh, method to. So first, you model the phenomenon, which in time amount, we wanted to be able to answer questions like, what happened on January 3rd, 1993? So to create a high-level representation of that data, what does that mean? Well, basically, it means that you go through and you figure out what exactly about this text do I need my, the computer to be able to recognize in order to answer that question. So we knew we needed to be able to model times and 
not just you know January 3rd, but relative times like two weeks ago, and events and the relationship between times and events. Because if you know event, an event happened, but you can't link it to the date, it's, it's pretty useless. So when you actually annotate the data, like I said, you apply it to the corpus. So basically that means you have annotators who you give your model to along with some annotation guidelines and you tell them this is the information we're interested in, go get a lot of it <laughs> so that we can use it later. And so for example with the time ML, if you have a sentence like last night Mary left the party before John arrived, there's a lot of information in that sentence. I mean there's three events, left, party, and arrived. So you'll notice that events can be both verbs and nouns because party is a noun. Last night is a temporal expression that you actually don't know, you can't assign a date to last night until you know when the reference point of the person speaking is. And of course there's before that signals the relationship between uh, Mary leaving and John arriving. So, um, so when you actually have your human annotators doing this, you need to make sure that the instructions are really clear for what information uh, you want and how you want it marked up. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about that, but we do recommend for quality that you have at least two people annotating each piece of data uh, who are working separately. So that way you can calculate, or calculate inter annotator agreement scores. Um, generally, there's a trend we've kind of noticed that if you have a task that's well defined enough to get inter good inter excuse me good inter annotator agreement scores, you're a lot more likely to be it, it's more likely to be a task that you can actually give to a machine. Um, so then you actually take all of the annotations, go through and make sure that there's no mistakes, come up with your gold standard. So a piece of data where everything is labeled correctly and everything that's supposed to be labeled is labeled. So um, once you have your, your gold standard, you train the algorithm. So like I said, you divide your corpus, you take not half, um, but a, a portion, could be half I guess, um, and uh, give it to whatever machine learning algorithm you're going to use. There's a couple options. Again, I'm not going to go into all the math right now. Um, but you get your toolkit like the NLTK and give it the information that you want to give it. And then once it's trained, you actually uh, can test it. So the data that you've set aside, it has an annotation on it. it ha so you know what you want the computer to be able to do with it. But when the computer analyzes it, it, it ignores that information. So that way afterwards you can compare what the computer comes up with to what the accurate annotation created by humans actually is. So you can see how well your computer is being able to model human understanding of the data. So it's kind of like a, final, like a closed book final exam for your algorithm. So once you have that data, then you can actually look and see, well, where is this not doing what I need it to do? And you might find that it's just you didn't have the right features, like maybe you do need to add part of speech tags or it's not finding where the sentences are, um, or you need to actually go back and revise your model. So you might, it might turn out that actually there's some other information in the text that we really need to add. Um, but it is advantageous to do this. Human annotation is very expensive and very slow. Uh, like Paul mentioned, I'm working with medical data, which can only be marked up by doctors, and they're really expensive per hour. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's kind of a problem. So we, you need to be able to actually have some sort of automated help with that. So when it comes to revising your task, like I said, uh, there's all sorts of different parts of this process that might need some revision. And time amount itself has undergone multiple revisions. We've uh, reconfigured how events and times are related a couple times. Um, as we come up with more ideas about how time and events are actually discussed in text. So the point is, Basically, don't be afraid to have to revise your task because it's something that you're pretty much going to have to do. Um, for the reading, uh, I mentioned the Natural Language Toolkit. It also has a book uh, at nltk.org, which is uh, free online. Um, it's really good for how to use the Natural Language Toolkit, but it also has a lot of really good information about just how machine learning works, how you actually run this stuff, um, and it comes with a lot of tool uh, a lot of out, uh, corpora as well, uh, so you don't have to create your own data to practice what 
what they're trying to show you how to do. Uh, the data mining book is written by the people who created the Weka toolkit, so it's another really good one to learn how to use the tools and how to use the theories. Mining the social web actually is Another really good introduction if you just want to start get your hands on data and start, it focuses mostly on unsupervised tasks, but it shows you how to actually mine Twitter for data. I actually just write that program and download anything that you might want to need. So if you just want to experiment with um, analyzing social networks, it's, it's a really good resource. And then, of course, my own book, which will be coming out in a couple months. And that one actually goes into more how you create your annotation the kind of pitfalls there are for that and the things that you need to take into consideration if you want to have a really good annotation task. So applying matter to learning analytics. Um, this actually goes back to Tom's talk where he was saying, you know, what, how exactly do you define skill? How, you know, how do you measure what we're looking to measure? And so the question I would have for you is, what are the questions in learning analytics that you could use a corpus to answer? Uh, I don't know. I, I'm not in learning analytics. But um, you can't really develop a model until you really know what you're trying to do. So based on some discussions I've had about learning analytics, um, I just come up with a couple ideas for things that you might want to think about. So if you had a corpus of student papers, uh, you could maybe try to predict how well a student will do in a class based on past performances. But in that case, you need to know, you know, how do you measure success? How can you label that in a document? And do those metrics vary by subject, by professor, by you know, school? Or is it different for community college than for Harvard? Um, can you measure student progress over a course? So compare their midterm to their final. Um, and again, but how do you measure if someone is progressing? What does that mean? And how can you teach a computer what that means? So uh, then if you wanted to maybe measure students' progress over their time in college, like you have all of their papers, that could be really interesting. But how do you then make generalizations across subjects? So I'm not saying that these things can't be done. Um, but it, I'm, I don't know the answers to those questions, unfortunately. Um, I do think that natural language processing and corpus linguistics could be very useful for learning analytics. Um, but it will take a little bit of effort to get those annotations done if you need them. Uh, unsupervised tasks are easy to set up, but they might not give you as much information as you need. Though I do think it would be really interesting if you took all the papers from a course and like put in, well, it wouldn't be unsupervised, but a simple labeling task if you had all the A papers, all the B papers, all the C papers, and all the, you know, failing or D papers, and went to see if the computer could find similarities between those. Um, and uh, creating your own annotated data set might seem kind of daunting, but it can definitely be worth the effort to actually go in that and have a program that will do the analysis that you need it to do. So I hope that was useful and that you learned something about corpus analysis that you can use. Um, that's my talk. So if there's any questions, trying to. Amber, thank you so much. I, um, how, I guess my first question is, uh, is the idea of, of learning analytics or personal learning environments or, 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 or self-directed learning, are those making their way into into the computer science departments? Or is that on y'all's radar as much as it is in, in, in other places? Um, that's a really interesting question. I admit that right now I'm kind of in my dissertation writing cave. So I'm not really keeping up on trends as much as I could be. I know there is a lot of interest in the human-computer interaction. Sorry, someone just tried to come in the room. Um, to, uh, and I could see how that would be leveraged into some sort of learning analytics. But I, I don't really know any specifics. Sorry. Well, no, it's, it, it's interesting because it, it, it seems like it, it's, it's an extremely new subject in so many places um, that, that there are skill sets and ideas like this and tools and, uh, that really can be applied to, to ideas uh, if the right people got together. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, a, it's really interesting. So I want to thank you again. Um, I'm looking, um, uh, it looks like uh, G. Everett asks, haven't existing learning analytics implementations begun with the behaviors of highly successful students or something like that? Do you, do you know? Uh, I 
don't I'm again I'm not really familiar with learning okay. analytics. Okay. So I'm not I'm not really sure. Um, but if there is some sort of uh, implementation of you know measuring student success, then that would be a really good place to start for corpus linguistics. Cool. Well, wonderful, Amber. Thank you so much for your time. Good luck with your book. Good luck with the rest of your semester. You should be. Uh, this is probably pretty high pressure time for you. So thanks for your hour. All right. Thank you. All right, bye. Bye. Um, our next presenter is um, Samantha Adams. She's the director of communications here at the NMC. Um, she's actually in the next room over from me, so I'm going to have to go uh, wake her up. Nope, she's here. Great. Um, she actually is uh, one of the many things that she does. She's a lead researcher and writer uh, for the NMC Horizon Report series. Um, and that's really what uh, Sam wants to talk about today, specific to learning analytics. So Sam, um, it's all yours. Thank you so much, Paul, for that introduction. Um, hello to everyone. I've actually been having a few issues with my webcam today, so I've only turned it on for the moment to say hi so that all of you can see that I am not, in fact, a learning analytics loving robot. So uh, as we delve more into the uh, NMC Horizon Project shortlist, I'm just going to um, stop my webcam. Okay, so very exciting stuff. Learning analytics is featured in the NMC Horizon Project shortlist. 2012 Higher Education Edition, which is available at nmc.org slash publications, and it's the top report right now. Um, and you can see um, a little bit the content that made it in, the 12 technologies that made it in. And you'll notice that learning analytics uh, has made it into the two to three years adoption horizon cycle, uh, which means that it is the advisory board believes that uh, learning analytics is poised for mainstream adoption within two to three years which is very exciting. Uh, what's especially interesting, interesting about that, um, as I had mentioned in a previous learning analytics workshop, is that in last year's higher education report, the advisory board voted it in the four to five year horizon, which means that there is consensus among a ton of thought leaders that learning analytics as an emerging technology topic is making much, prog much progress. Um, and to add to that, this year's shortlist uh, advisory board actually voted a brand new topic into the shortlist, and we'll get to that right here, uh, and that is adaptive learning environments. Uh, adaptive learning environments reflect an interesting convergence between learning analytics and personal learning environments. There's a lot of questions I've heard in the NMC community along the lines of, okay, so we're using learning analytics, now what do we actually do with that data? Well, adaptive learning environments is one interesting response. Whereas personal learning environments, which has been another Horizon topic, um, is an online place where students can build and choose their own resources that reflect their own styles of learning, adaptive learning environments make use of learning analytics to provide real-time learning interventions to the students in their online environments. Of course, these ideas all sound good and well, but you know, at the NMC, what we most mostly care about um, is, are these ideas actually Im being implemented and are they working? Um, because right now, learning analytics and adaptive learning environments are relatively new uh, and fluid topics, um, adaptive learning environments being especially new. Um, so a lot of the, um, the most well-documented research comes from corporations who have actually created the learning analytics and adaptive learning environment software. Well, the NMC has been fortunate to work with the HP Catalyst Initiative, which is made up of uh, over 50 STEM plus education projects that are happening all over the globe, and around six or seven involve learning analytics and adaptive learning environments in action. Uh, one shining example of this that I'd like to point out um, is taking place at Enrita University in India, where they're actually building a multilingual, a multilingual collaborative platform that could be used remotely to teach language, uh, promote adaptive learning and run virtual experiments. The platform actually is going to include a framework for the assessment of reporting and procedural skills so that students can then better concentrate their efforts on the subject areas they need to master. Um, a video overview of this project along with videos of other similar projects can be found on the NMC iTunes U page. It's this link and I'm going to type it into the chat right now. And there's new projects and videos um, that are popping up in that link in that collection all the time. So I definitely recommend that you subscribe to it to get the latest. 
Um, but of course, there are many projects emerging that showcase innovative and successful uses of learning analytics. That's why we're all here. Um, and if that topic is voted in by the advisory board in the full report, which comes out in February, we'll be looking for such projects to feature. So make sure to submit any learning analytics projects or articles that either you're involved in or aware of uh, to go.nmc.org slash projects. And I will type that in here as well. Yes, I definitely strongly recommend that you submit your projects. We'd love to feature them. And we really hope that, we'll share, that you'll share the link to the shortlist with your colleagues and institutions and start your own meaningful discussions about uh, what your take on learning analytics is, if you agree on the adoption horizon that the advisory boards uh, placed it in, um, and if there's other types of um, in-action, uh, in-practice examples that you can think of. And if you have any questions for me, I'm, I'm happy to answer them in the chat. Uh, thanks for having me on, guys. Uh, I'm looking forward to, to seeing uh, what happens with learning analytics and the full report. Uh, and back to you, Paul. Thanks, Sam. Um, thanks, everyone. We've, we've just gone over our hour. Um, I do want to just, um, uh, again, thank uh, Brandeis and David and Amber and um, Ruben and Zach and Johan, um, Tom, and everyone that's participated in the actual workshop. We had uh, a lot of great work and great ideas flowing for that week. And then everyone that joined us today, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. Again, um, if this is something that, uh, that you guys feel is valuable and would like to see more of, just let us know at communications at nmc.org um, that this is something that you'd like us to do more often. And uh, we'll try to uh, keep you updated on when these webinars, the New Horizon uh, Connect series, will come out. Um, we will be launching the, the 2012 higher ed edition of the NMC Horizon Report at the Eli conference in February in Austin. So um, there'll be a lot of talk about learning analytics there, as well as uh, the other innovations and technologies that are in the report. So um, again, David, um, thank you much. Um, Nerla, uh, have a great uh, symposium. And I uh, hope everyone has a great winter solstice and New Year's and whatever holiday you decide to observe, uh, if any. <laughs>